Welcome to the Asbestos Knowledge Empire. What does asbestos management mean to you? I used to really struggle with the asbestos management at my site, but now it's a breeze. It used to be really expensive. I was paying loads, but now I've got my asbestos power team in place. It's so much easier. Asbestos can be a pain in the ass if not handled right. We had to stop the job because asbestos was discovered. Now we don't have that problem. Asbestos management is easier than you think. Asbestos management. Be proactive, not reactive. Think about asbestos first, not last. And now your hosts, best-selling authors and asbestos experts, Ian Stone and Neil Munro. Welcome to the Asbestos Knowledge Empire. I'm Ian Stone. And I'm Neil Munro. So today we're talking about the six things that you need to know when reviewing your asbestos information. Yeah, reviewing it, or if you're coming in new to a company as a sort of duty holder's representative, if you start from scratch how you sort of get your head round where you are with regards to asbestos management and compliance, really. Yeah, it's kind of how do you look at and see exactly where you're at with asbestos yeah, management? Yeah, what do you need to look at? What, what sort of information do you need to gather and what do you need to look out for? So hopefully we're going to talk you through some sort of like hints, tips, sort of stuff that we look for when we're reviewing some of our clients' portfolios. Yeah, when we do desktop studies, full reviews, audits, that type of stuff. Yeah, obviously the bigger the portfolio, the more complex and complicated and lots of documents. So, you know, some desktop studies can take a couple of hours if it's just a one site, whereas if you've got multiple sites, we've spent sort of months on some clients just reviewing their information and going through all their, their documents, etc., so the first thing that we're going to talk about is historical information. Obviously, that's where you're going to start with. But what do we actually mean by historical information? Well, there's lots of stuff. And there's sort of two ways of looking at it. You've got historical asbestos information and yeah. you've got historical building information. And both can have multiple and complex documents to look at. So generally, we all start with the asbestos information just to review on what exactly they have got for the properties or buildings, etc. Yeah. So it's a good starting point, isn't it? It is, because if you're reviewing asbestos information and you've got asbestos information, that's what we're looking for. So that, that's the best point to start at. If there isn't any asbestos information, then that's where you would revert back to the building looking information. Looking for, yeah, what the construction, the ages and stuff like that. Yeah, but if you've got asbestos information that says asbestos is identified, that's kind of the, the starting point, really. Yeah, so each... Asbestos air report is very different, isn't it? This is where some clients find it difficult and, and they usually do need a bit of help with because obviously with the guidance which came out in 2010, the survey guide, that put a bit of structure into to what survey, asbestos survey report should look like and what they should include. And that was the trying to sort of put a bit of a benchmark across the industry so it was less confusing for different duty holders to look at different companies' asbestos survey reports. But prior to that, there was no sort of real guidance on what should be in the asbestos survey reports. If we go back to MDHS 100, okay, that specified how a survey should be carried out, but there was no sort of guidance on what should be included and how the asbestos survey report should be produced. No, exactly. There was no information in there about, like I say, just one general layout, two, how to present the asbestos information, what plans should look like. It was kind of really, like you say, limited. There was no information. It was just made up. It was, you kind of, before that, we were putting in information that we felt was good, but in 2010, it did standardise it more. However, I would say that a lot of companies out there still aren't complying with that fully. Oh, absolutely not. No, no. And the biggest one is plans, isn't it? Because if you actually look and and read the guidance, so um, plans shouldn't have multiple colours, all different symbols, for producing the plans and, and marking on and identifying the asbestos on plans. We still see plans like that. Now, there was an argument that if you'd go too far in the guidance on, on telling people how the report should be produced, it, it kind of levels out the playing field and uh, some companies find that might be restricting their their sort of USPs. Um, yeah. Because a lot of people, you know, at the end of the day, what is an asbestos server report? It's the end product and what, and what we do, really. And lots of companies hang their sort of their coats on producing their reports in their way. I mean, the thing is, as well, it's like I, I get why people still 
don't follow the guidance because it's only guidance. Yeah. You don't have to follow it. You don't have to follow it to the letter. However, I don't know. For me, when 264 came out, it did simplify a lot of stuff that prior to this I felt was overcomplicated. And I don't know, it just it makes it easier because that's what we're trying to do at the end of the day is making the information readily available yeah. for clients, for staff members to use. Yeah, and we sometimes forget that because um, we worked for a company who produced plans in this format, didn't we? You know, yeah. had lots of different colours on the plans. And I remember producing some server reports, which were complex, and looking at the plans and thinking, they are beautiful. <laughs> yeah. They're all these different colours. Not like rainbows and unicorns. <laughs> but to be honest, you know, you needed like a degree to work out what was actually going on. Yeah. And it was very, very confusing. Like, it, so I do get the, the standardisation of the plans. When you looked at the report, only when you're using that format and that template day in, day out, yeah. do you look at it and it clicks. Exactly Because that. you look at it, you go, oh, look, magenta's uh, vinyl tiles. Yes, or, you don't have to look at a key because you know it off yeah, by that. Red's AIB, the little triangles, uh, flooring or mastic or whatever. It's like, yeah, you, you get to know it, but... In reality, you if you're a lay have person to... who's never really read a server report before. But it pissed me off. If, if I'm reading a report and I'm looking at the plan, and I'm, every time I see that. something, I've got to refer back to the king and go, hold on a minute. Okay, that's a bit of boxing. Okay, that's flooring or whatever. Yeah. It's not user-friendly. It's not easy. No, no. So I definitely do agree with the keep it simple, use one colour for asbestos, use another colour for um, no access or presumed asbestos. And that's it, really, and, yeah. and hatch those areas. And, and mark on, definitely mark on the asbestos locations because it is good to see where they are definitely within the, the actual asbestos locations. Yeah, and also within the room, I like to see where it, where it is rather than just a, a little dot in the middle of a room or something. It's better when it kind of pinpoints and highlights exactly where the asbestos is because then again... It becomes more user friendly. Yeah, went off on a little bit of a tangent on reports, then didn't we? We did, yeah, yeah a little one, a little one. I mean, so what does make a good report? Well, yes, two six four came out. HSG two six four asbestos surveyors guide that yeah. came out in two thousand and ten. Now, we're not saying that every report after that is good, and every report before that is crap. There's still good. There's a lot in the sand. Yes, there's well, an old information there. Yeah, I definitely think there's two lines in the sand. So there is that, that guidance, and then there's the MDHS 100 guidance as well. There are definitely lines in the sand. Anything before MDHS 100 really isn't, I wouldn't say it isn't worth the papers, but it can't be fully relied on, because before that guidance, then really, especially surveys, there was no sort of specification to what should be sampled. And... Not all materials were indeed sampled prior no. to MDHS 100. So, you know, stuff like mastic pads and yeah. um, the lower risk stuff, but... Generally speaking, lower risk stuff was kind of, was left off. Yeah, it was kind of not bothered with. That said, though, from looking at it from a hos- historical point of view, if you've got a survey report that's like 30 years old or something, yeah. and it says there's asbestos there, yeah. well, happy days, because you, you can look at it and... You can note that in. I wouldn't... Um, rely on that that's sampled everything. Exactly. I wouldn't rely on it and go, right, I'm happy with that information because it is old, donkey's years old. Yeah. It's not in line with the guidance or anything like that. However, it's giving me an insight. Yeah. That's what I would take from that. And then sort of the later 2000s coming up towards the 2010 kind of line in the sand, like you say, Industry was kind of forewarned from HSE of these things coming in, so the reports did to get start to get better. Yeah, did start to standardise a bit more, so it would give you a bit more kind of reliance upon, I would say. And also, looking at companies that are UCAS accredited as well gives you that level of uh, again a, benchmark because yeah, a benchmark of kind of a level of certainty to a point. Yeah. But, the point of being UCAS credited is, is you having an independent body coming in and checking that we're working to those guidance and those guidelines. Yeah. So it does give you a bit, a bit of an extra reassurance that the, the survey report does meet the, or should meet what's expected, really. Yeah. I mean, one other thing um, that's kind of important that was highlighted and changed slightly in 264 was the, the fact of no access areas going into reports. Years ago, 
blanket no accesses used to just be put into every report. Or oh, caveats. Literally, yeah, yeah caveats. Um, or well, like caveats and no accesses. Well, yeah. Then, you know, it was like, we don't do this, we don't do that. And yeah. by the way, we've got to tell you, we don't do this either. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there, there was like, there was reports I've seen in the past where... Don't go above two metres. Exactly that. Yeah. Don't go above two metres. Oh, we don't access within ceiling voids. So... We, the caveat, the two metre one is a classic because it's like, so it's what, ridiculous. You, don't, you don't go in the ceiling void at all. You just go for a wander. <laughs> wander through a building and yeah. have a little sample of some stuff and that's about it. Like, if you take an office block, I'd say 80% of the asbestos is going to be in the heavy <laughs> ceiling void, isn't it? Exactly that. Exactly that. So th- those are kind of things to watch out for in historical information. Yeah. Um, it's historical survey reports. Yeah, definitely. Caveats, no accesses. And again, that that is still... What we try and educate our clients is always look out for the no accesses because people tend to skip past them, don't they? And so on the flip side, what to look for in a good report? Well, if you are reviewing, all you've got to do is get a copy of 264 and review what should be in that report and check it's in there. So executive summary, scope of works, the data, the plans, the analytical certificate, if all that information's in there and it's a UCAS accredited report, well, and it, it is basically then going to be complying with HSG 264, yeah. which is what we work to now. So that's kind of the flip side of what constitutes as a good report. Yeah, that kind of covers so reports, but there's, yes. there's other rare documents and stuff that need to be reviewed as well. So, yes. for instance, yeah. uh, analytical stuff. Analytical stuff, asbestos removal, paperwork. Yeah, waste notes. Refurbishment um, paperwork, old CDM files. All those types of things. Yeah. It's quite important as well. So when you're looking to sort of try and identify what asbestos is actually left within a building, so you've, you've got an asbestos survey report, you've got various removal documents, you do need to read those quite carefully because sometimes clients get confused because, okay, I've paid for, I can see historically, I've paid for some asbestos insulating board to be removed from the bathroom cupboard. Okay, so that item has now gone. However, you need to read the removal paperwork carefully because sometimes what happens is, it's okay, we've removed 90% of that material, but there was a bit that was left. And that will only be recorded on the certificate of reoccupation. So it's then cross-referencing that back to your register as well. So although the box in or whatever it is has been removed on the whole, on the whole, there's still elements that may still be left. So, so there could be bits. So where the where boxing or something like that goes up into the void, it might need to be broken out, and perhaps that couldn't be undertaken within that part of the project. Yeah. So therefore, it was capped off and sealed. Yeah. And for all intents and purposes, if you look at the information, you go, right, well, I paid for X. I've got a waste note. That doesn't always correlate. Yeah, it's not gone, gone. No. <laughs> and also... You need to look at all bits for it because, again, if you look at what you've paid for versus the contractor's plan of works, well, the plan of works might say it's to be fully removed. Yeah. However, like you say, when they come to do the job, they ran into difficulties, something couldn't get removed fully. So the only place that's going to be recorded is on the analyst's um, four-stage clearance or certificate of reoccupation. Yes. So that's why those other elements kind of give a hint at what might have happened, but that final sign-off paperwork should be the one that you're kind of relying on. Yeah, and you need all paperwork as well. Yes. Um, So, you know, just a waste note doesn't tell you the full story and doesn't give you adequate information to say that material has been removed safely. But there should always be, you know, if there is licensed works and licensed removal works, there should always be a certificate of reoccupation um, issued. So I find that, that information down. Yeah, and I find that in the past they're all separates. Nothing was ever put together like we do. We, yes, we always put completion a pack. Yeah, project completion yeah. pack. It's got everything in there. So if in the future we need to review it or the client needs to review it, well, they've got everything in one place. Yeah, all encompassing and a dated register. Yeah. Um, whereas in the past, I mean. In the past, like if we're talking 20 years ago, some companies only issued paperwork statements of cleanliness, paperwork, paper copies. Of, paper, hard copies. Yeah, yeah hard yeah. copy of a, a four-stage clearance. That would be stuck on the wall in the boiler room. Yeah. That's the only copy they ever had. Yeah, yeah. It wasn't ever electronic. It wasn't, no. nothing was updated. It's just, 
right, your clearance is done, mate. I've put a copy in the in the boiler room so you know it's safe. Yeah. And that's it. And then where's that today? Exactly. Where is it? It's yeah. gone. It's uh, disappeared or it's faded. So how would you kind of get around that, do you think? So if you haven't got, you know you've had removals done, you haven't got all the paperwork, really the only way to sort of alleviate whether that material is still there or not is to go and have a look at it, really, isn't it? Yeah. So updating that information, that maybe you employing a, a surveyor or surveying company to go and review that information, it's kind of, review kind of, those works. Yeah, it's kind of a just to see what's reinspection or yeah. a resurvey of the area. It depends on depends on the material on how obvious it is it yeah. would be removed or not. So that's kind of the importance between obviously that's going to cost if you get into, if you're employing somebody to go and do that. So the more information that you can actually get hold of and the the, the complete picture that you can build the better it will be moving forward and in the long run potentially be cheaper because you've got the full picture and, and keeping all that information up to date in the long run will probably save you money as well. Definitely. So you've tracked down survey reports, you've tracked down removal paperwork, you've tracked down building stuff. What what are you actually going to do with this? How do you record it to to see? Because if, if you've only got one property, it's quite straightforward. You can just literally have a flick through and by the end of having a flick through of all those documents, you kind of have an idea of where you're at. But if you're, a, I don't know, you've got a portfolio of 100 properties, you need to do something a little bit more. So what I would do is to create kind of a spreadsheet and start detailing down what surveys you've got for the properties. So start with the, the property types, what surveys you've got for the property. Is it up to date? Is it up to spec? Have you got removal paperwork? Is it highlighting there's asbestos there? Is it high risk? Is it medium risk? Is it low risk? Start literally pinpointing all this down. Yeah, Yeah, because then when you've got that all-encompassing spreadsheet of that information for your whole portfolio, you can then start filtering off and breaking down again and looking at it in in further detail. Yeah, trying to prioritise what you need to do. And that's it, really. It's kind of, that's the point of the review, is to pinpoint and just see everything as a whole of what you've got are there any glaringly obvious issues straight away? Yeah, yeah. Because they'll raise their hand on the spreadsheet. It's like if you've got a property that was built 60s, 70s, and you've got no information. Yeah, and you know, and you know, because you know your properties, and you know it's a dirty, horrible, dingy, hasn't had a lot of money spent on it over the years. Yeah. You know, they're the sort of sites where you think, mm, we need to get out there and have a look to see what we've you, got. You kind of, your gut feeling tells you. Yeah, exactly. Just that. from that basic information, <clears throat> yeah. let alone, I mean, photos of, of properties as well, if you review them, you can... Well, you might have one of those buildings, but you know it's been refitted two or three times in the last sort of 10, 20 years. Mm. Chances are, if it's been completely refitted, you're probably not going to have an existing asbestos problem there, potentially. Yeah, potentially. As, a, as opposed to... Um, Some of it might have been removed with the, the refits. With the refits and stuff like that, as opposed to, you know, you've got no information on, on a property. So I prioritise the no information, nothing's been done over that and if you've got looking at that information you've got lots of sites where asbestos has been identified and it may have highlighted that works needed done doing you know a few years ago and you know nothing's been done that would be on sort of high on my priority as well to get back out there yeah because because knowing and not doing is bad yeah like you, you review the information there's a survey done five years ago the recommendation was this must be removed urgently and it's not happened well i mean it's obvious that's definitely a port of call to to look at yeah. straight away yeah definitely if you're going to get investigated by the hc that's the sort of questions you, you know they'll be asking you know you knew about this asbestos five years ago it was damaged then you've not done anything bad of it they'd look heavily down on that for sure that is it really that's what the whole purpose is it's to look at plan prioritize any issues to try and get you up to date as quickly as possible that's kind of the issue that you're trying to solve with a review now if you're a duty holder it might be something that you're comfortable doing on your own 
like I say, if you've got a large portfolio, it's something that you might not be comfortable with or might not want to. Yeah. It's, it's a, a lot massive ball ache. And it's quite tedious as well. It is. Literally, you know, flicking through um, reports. And when you've got lots of different reports, it's trying to extract that information because they all look different. They're, they're, they're all recorded in different elements in different places. And different language used different in language them. Different language as well. It's kind of getting on top of all of that. It can be a bit of a minefield, picking yeah. back through old reports and stuff and extrapolating the, the useful information out of them. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, like you say, we, we've spent... Well, that's the problem with them. When you start, I mean, a client will give you a box of survey reports. You think, oh, it would take me a day to do. But when you start getting your teeth stuck into it, God, I mean, sometimes I've been stuck on desktop study for days and days and days yeah. and I'm sick to the back teeth of it by the end but yeah. it's because one thing leads to another and then yeah. you're cross-checking backwards forwards yeah. and then you'll like get to the point where you're happy you've got that information yeah. then you're recording it down on your spreadsheet and 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 it just kind of continues until you get to the end of it so it might be something that you want to employ a, a consultant to to do for you because they probably would do it in a, a quicker manner yeah, I'll be honest, I've never done a desktop study and everything's been all good and really easy. Everything's been, everything's been rosy. Yeah, I've everything's had a look. been in place. Um, they've had everything and, yeah, it was really easy. Yeah. I've never done an easy one. No. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's our, our gift and our curse of what we do. Yeah, doing. exactly. But then I suppose, you know, that from the client's point of view, um, if it was easy, they'd do it themselves probably. So. Yeah, and that's it. They want to know the hard stuff. Do you holders want to know the issues? Uh, yeah, and it's getting that a professional opinion as opposed to taking their own, especially with the big portfolio clients. When you've got multiple sites... You don't want to take a risk, do you, on maybe looking at a bit of information and getting it wrong? Mm. It so, can be a can of worms. Like, and if you look and think everything's all right on the surface, but then when it starts getting scratched, it just yeah. it's like a thread that you start pulling and it just leads who knows where. That's the, that can be the problem sometimes. Yeah, definitely. Well, that was the six things that you need to know when reviewing specialist information. I hope you've enjoyed that. Yeah. Just to recap, the six things were historical information and what information do we mean by that? Survey reports, what determines a bad and a good report? Yeah. Removal paperwork, what have you got and what story does it tell? Cross referencing it against the information that you've got, your existing registers. What are you doing with all of this information? How should you go about recording it? Reviewing the findings and looking at it on the whole and pinpointing holes and issues. And then finally, what's next? How to plan and prioritise the asbestos issues that you've identified. Great. I thought that was really good. I enjoyed it. Okay. Yeah, I hope you did too. Um, Remember, asbestos first, not last.